Hi, and welcome to Year 11 Chemistry Paper 2 Revision with me, Mr. Duffy, and today we're looking at Topic 6, Rate of Reaction. This is both on the combined and triple course. You need to know all of these things, so we'll be doing it all together. So what does rate mean? Rate is how fast something happens, and the key phrase is per unit time. For example, an appropriate unit of time for an explosion will be milliseconds or even microseconds. That's a millionth of a second, whereas an appropriate unit of time for rusting would be like weeks or months. It all depends on what you are studying, but per unit time will be a key phrase in today's lesson. So you're going to be looking at different factors that affect the rate of reaction, temperature, whether it's hot or cold, surface area when it comes to solids or pressure when it comes to gases and so on. The key point about a chemical reaction is A plus B will make product C plus D and chemistry is all about electrons. The protons and neutrons are buried in the, the nucleus. Chemistry is all about the transfer or sharing of electrons. So why all atoms want to have a full outer shell? Why am I emphasizing this? Because it's about collision theory. In order to transfer elections, electrons, they must be touching, okay? So A must actually collide with B to transfer or share electrons. With enough energy, we call the activation energy to make a product. If it makes a product, it's called a successful collision, okay? So you may be familiar with this from topic five, the activation energy is key. There's your energy level diagram. So the first thing I'm going to look at is temperature and rate. And in general, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction increases. The key phrase is the molecules will have more kinetic energy. There will be more frequent collisions, more successful collisions, and the rate of reaction will in increase. Hot things react more quickly than cold. And here will be a graph that would illustrate that. Notice it's not directly proportional. And that's why human bodies are 37 degrees Celsius. If you get too cold or chemical reactions don't occur quickly enough and you will have hypothermia. Next is concentration and rate. Well, this is pretty easy. As the concentration increases, well, there will be more frequent collisions, more successful collisions, and the rate increases. And here's the key phrase, because there are more particles per unit volume, there will be more collisions per unit time. That's straight off the market scheme. It's must what you must say. Again, I'm really hammering home that point. And... Yeah, it would be directly proportional as long as you can keep everything else. If you keep increasing the concentration, you will increase the rate or you will get the inversely proportional graph if you are measuring reactant consumption instead of product production. Next, on to pressure and rate, and this is all to do with gases because gases can be compressed, solids and liquids cannot be compressed. And again, it's the same answer. More frequent collisions, more successful collisions, and the rate of reaction will increase. Pretty straightforward. But again, more particles per unit volume, so more collisions per unit time. That's the phrasing you must use to hit the marks. And here's a graph showing that. Okay, with red being a high pressure, green being low. Next, surface area, and that's to do with solids, because liquids and gases literally don't have a surface area. From right to left, you can see a full tablet, a half tablet, a quarter tablet, and a crushed up tablet. You know from living in the real world that the powder tablet will react much more quickly than a whole tablet. The reason is this, surface area. Now, I'm going to go back to nanoparticles. This is off topic one, okay? But just quickly, surface area is very important. Smaller things have a larger surface area than bigger things. They have more surface area exposed. And the, the larger the surface area, the volume ratio, the more useful it is. It just exposes all the hidden surfaces. So low or high increases the rate. And you might be asked to do a surface area to volume calculation like this. So just to be aware that you have to be able to do that. Next, here's another graph showing it. Small reacts faster than large. Five, finally, is catalysts, okay? They are substantives that increase the rate of reaction without being consumed in the reaction. So you only need a small amount of them. All enzymes, for example, are catalysts or biological catalysts. They lower the activation energy one mark, 
by providing an alternative reaction pathway the second mark. That's what you always must say. Here's a picture of some catalysts here. So, yeah, this is from paper one. They just provide it. They just basically provide a surface for stuff to react. And they lower the activation energy, and you must be able to draw that on the graph. And here's the marking scheme. Exactly what I said. So, if here's in a real life exam questions now. The students study the effect of changing the concentration of the hydrochloric acid. So, look at the picture here. She's increasing the concentration from 0.5 molar to 2. But I want you to pay attention to the magnesium ribbon. They're identical, same surface area, same length, same size. I presume she's keeping the temperature the same. So let's look at what questions they would ask in an exam. But notice I've highlighted the gas. The gas is what she's measuring produced. So two variables she should control. Temperature, mass or length of magnesium, surface area, all of what I've just said. And part B, the rate of reaction increased as the concentration increased. More particles per unit time, so more collisions per unit time. You're going to get sick of me saying per unit per unit, but that's what the marking scheme says, so that's what you're going to say. Explain why increasing the temperature will increase the rate of reaction. Particles will have more kinetic energy, more collisions per unit time, and therefore more collisions with the activation energy. They're called successful collisions. Now... Here's an example here. A student wanted to increase the rate of reaction of hydrogen and iodine to make hydrogen iodide. And notice that they're all gases. Increasing the volume of the reaction vessel, is that a good idea or a bad idea, number one? Or increasing the temperature? Well, I think common sense will say that increasing the volume is bad and increasing the temperature is good. But let's get the exact answer now. You might want to spend a moment reading this. Increasing the volume decreases the pressure, less product per unit time. Increasing the temperature would increase the rate, more kinetic energy, more product per unit time. Now, next, you need to be able to calculate the rate of reaction from graphs and so on. Now, there's two ways of calculating the rate of reaction. You can either calculate the amount of a reactant consumed per unit time, or the amount of a product produced per unit time. In reality, we nearly always use product per unit time. It's just much, much easier to do. So they can be really fast or really slow, but we have to measure the rate of reaction. And you must be able to convert from time as well. Let's remember that as well. So here's a standard reaction with a gas syringe. This will, you am sure you're familiar with by now. Producing gas, you'd measure what volume of gas was produced Per unit time so 27 centimeter cubed in 50 seconds 0.5 centimeter cubed per second 15 centimeter cubed in two minutes there's the trick i convert to seconds and i get my rate that way that's the rate of reaction here's a real life exam question with the two minute trick again they want your answer in standard form for an extra mark so 1.5 by 10 to the minus 3. And you might want to play and pause. I made this question up myself. But if you can understand this, you can understand anything. Basically, there's 1,209,600 seconds in two weeks. Now, whoa, 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 whoa. That's paper one, Moles. What's he doing? What's he doing? Uh, you need to be aware that your exam papers are synoptic. What does synoptic mean? It means they can ask you anything from paper one on a paper two paper. Will they ask you mostly paper two questions? Of course, but they are allowed to ask you about moles, so you can't just forget about them, okay? I know it's not fair. I know it's not fair, okay? But they, this, they are allowed to ask this. How many moles of iron oxide were formed over the two weeks? They are... They're allowed to ask you that, and they will. So calculating the rates of reaction, and this time calculating the rates from graphs, okay? So again, the amount of product formed per unit time. And it is not directly proportional generally, and the reason is this, okay? Why can you, why do they curve and then flatten out? Well, the, your example is to do with limiting reactants here and collision theory, okay? 
So the second I start a chemical reaction, the quantities of A and B, the reactant will start to decrease, and the quantities of A, B, the product will increase. If the concentration of the reactants decrease, there will be less collisions per unit time. This is why the rate of reaction is always fastest at the beginning. You get the steepest curve at A, and then at B it slows down as there's less frequent collisions, and at C it will stop altogether when one of the reactants has run out, either A or B. So, this is exactly just what I've said. You can read it yourself. And then finally at C, the limiting reactant has run out and the line will remain straight. So what's going on here? State which of these reactants, A, B, or C, produce the most product, clearly C. That's pretty obvious. Which finished first, which went to the straight line first was B. And what was the slowest, the less steep was A. Now calculating the rate of reaction from graphs, it's a little difficult because of the curves, okay? So you have to be able to work with curves. So for example, calculate the rate at five seconds. You need to be able to draw a tangent uh, to the slope of the curve. I presume you know how to do that from maths, hopefully. And then you calculate the slope of the tangent using the classic y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So the key thing for me is I generally pick simple x, x axis values and then use y values accordingly. So here's my step one, identify five seconds. Step two, draw a tangent at five seconds. Step three, identify two easy points. I pick zero and five and then 10 and 16. Plug them into your formula, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and then you'll get your answer. You need to flick back if you don't follow that. It's absolutely crucial you're able to do that. They might also ask you to find the rate of change between points on a graph, okay, between two points. In this case, you don't have to do the slope of the tangent. You just have to find the difference in the two points. Here's it example I'll show you now, okay? So find the mean rate of reaction between 10 and 18 seconds. Well, I'm gonna find 10 and 18 seconds on my graph, and I draw a line up to the green line, and I see that it is 2.2 in the difference, 16 and then 14.8, and in blue, the time is eight seconds. So I can, quite simply, 2.2 divided by eight, 0.275 centimeter cube per second. What about decreasing reactants? Although we don't really use it in real life, you have to be able to draw it from the graph. So here's some examples of that. Calculate the rate of reaction at 50 seconds to two significant figures. Well, I'm gonna quite simply draw a tangent to the curve. I pick a nice zero as an X1 and 150 and then just plug the mat in and I'll get the same answer. I know it's not quite as clear as the colored one. My handwriting is a little messy, but there you go. And here's another example from the same graph at 150 seconds. It's going to be a less steep, so it's going to be a slower rate. The rate here is 0 0.0053. And when I do the maths on this, just follow the numbers. I get 0 0.002, less than half the rate because it's a shallower slope. Another example, calculate the mean rate of reaction between 0 and 50 seconds. Well, I draw a line up to, from 50 seconds in green to 80. 80 divided by 50, 1.6, couldn't be easier. Complete the figure by drawing a line of for best fit. Forgive me, I have done this on Microsoft Paint, so it's not the greatest line of best fit but it will do for our purposes, okay? Yeah, I know, it's not that smooth, I know, I know. Okay, so determine the mean rate of reaction between zero and 60 seconds, use data from the graph. Well, here we go. I find 60 seconds, draw a line up and go across and it's 45, 45 divided by 60, 0 0.753 seconds and give the unit four marks for that. Absolute loving it. Determine the mean rate of reaction between 20 and 105 seconds and give the unit. 
Well, I'm going to identify 20 in 105 seconds. And it's 85 seconds is the difference between that and blue. And I get 0.038 off the graph and 0.0014. You have to get good at working at these uh, graphs with small decimals. I just generally look at, the, I ignore the zero to the left and just look at the whole number of values. I'm really just seeing 14 and at 1.4 and 38. So when you do the math on that, you will get 2.8 by 10 to the minus 5. Problem solved. And if you don't believe me, here's the real life marking scheme. Exact same. Another example here. Here, obviously, the, the higher concentration leads to a faster rate. Explain why the lines of best fit on figure 2 become horizontal. Well, that's pretty easy. The reaction is stopped. There is a limiting reactant. Okay, that's why they both become horizontal. And then you are asked to show that the zinc powder reacts more slowly. How does figure 2 show? It is a less steep curve okay so it produces less gas per unit time and then the question d here asks you to determine the rate of reaction at 80 seconds for the lower line so i locate 80 seconds i draw my slot tangent to the curve in green i pick two easy points in this case i pick 30 and 150 and then just plug them in and it's five marks for doing that. Five marks for a tangent to a curve. I know it's not the easiest, but once you get your head around it, five marks. Think how much you'd have to write for a six mark question to get five marks. Loving it. Determine the rate of reaction when there was 0.95 grams. Well, draw a line here, 0.95. And again, same thing. Easy. Calculate the mean rate of reaction when the time is complete. Well, I'm going to say it was complete at 270 seconds. That's where it went straight. And then at 150.3. So basically, it started off at 152.5. When I subtract 150.3, I get 2.2 grams was consumed in 270 seconds, which gives you that really long number there that I make into 8.15 by 10 to the minus 3 because it's set to three significant figures. Again, here's the marking scheme. I'm not lying to you. That's exactly what you do. Okay, and another example. You can follow these with play and pause, play and pause. Again, notice I pick easy x-axis values. Now, on to experiment five, rate of reaction, okay? You need to be able to measure the rate of reaction from experiments, okay? And then there's two things you need to be able to do. A gas product, where you measure the volume of gas produced per unit time, or a solid product, you measure how long it takes for a solution to turn cloudy. That's the sodium thiosulfate one. I'm going to go through both of these in detail now. So firstly, with gas production... You would have a gas syringe attached and a stopwatch. Or you can do it this way where the gas will force the liquid down. You can do it that way. Or this would, both these methods will give you this shape graph. The third way you can do this experiment though is like this. If you have a really sensitive balance, you can just let the gas escape and measure the mass loss of the gas. But because gases are such a are very light, have a low density, that you need a very sensitive balance for this to result, but you will get a curve like the one on the right instead of this shape curve if you're measuring a decrease. But again, yeah, a really sensitive balance needed. It is the best of the three methods, but it is a, you need a really sensitive balance and say one of your products is chlorine gas, that could be dangerous. So experimental write-ups, again, what you are measuring and how you are measuring it. I've said this several times, I don't need to keep going over it again, you know yourselves by now. So, rate of reaction, you're going to measure the volume of gas, 
and you must talk about concentration A, B, temperature, or C, surface area. You will be changing one of those, and you must keep the others the same, okay? That's where you get the marks. How you change one of the variables and how you control the others. So how are you going to measure the rate? Well, a gas syringe and a stopwatch is the most obvious method, I think. You can That's the one we use in schools. How are you going to change the independent variable? Well, if you're using temperature, you could change or use a water bath. If you're changing concentration, well, just change the concentration of the solution. If you're changing the surface area, maybe crush it up. You know, you know yourself. Okay, so how are you going to control the other variables? I want you to look at the magnesium strips in this real life picture of changing concentration. They're the exact same size and shape, okay? So I've controlled the variable of surface area. So here's some real life exam questions again. There's the surface area being exactly the same. You've seen this one before. So I'm going to show you the right up here, and you might want to play and pause because there's a bit of reading here, of changing the temperature of hydrochloric acid. So I have magnesium and hydrochloric acid, and I'm going to measure the volume of hydrogen gas produced with a gas syringe. Here's a bit of a messy drawing of the setup, but there you go. The balance is for the magnesium rhythm. So set the water back to 20 degrees Celsius. I probably should have said measured with a thermometer, but water baths have their own inbuilt thermometers anyhow. Place 20 centimeter cubed with a measuring cylinder. Now here's a key point. You must give it time to adjust. You don't start the stopwatch straight away. Give the solute mixture time to adjust it to 20 degrees Celsius. All common sense here. Cut a five centimeter strip. Measure its mass with a balance, place it in, and then start the stopwatch. Record what volume of gas was reduced in 30 seconds, and then divide by that time to get the rate. And then you repeat the experiment for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, three times. Calculate a mean. You know how to write up an experiment by now, I would hope. So imagine this one here. You have to be able to adapt on the day. CO2 gas is the exact same thing. Just spend a second reading this, maybe pause it. Now we're on to the solid production, and you do need to know this word turbidity. It means it's cloudy, how long it takes to turn cloudy. This is when one of your products is a precipitate or a solid. It's going to make the uh, solution cloudy. You put a cross beneath it, and when you can no longer see the cross, you stop the stopwatch that's how you measure the rate of reaction it's not that precise as we're going to see but that's how you do it okay the classic example is sodium thiosulfate anything thio means sulfur in uh, science and as you can see highlighted in red is a sulfur product that will make the solution go cloudy till the cross below it can no longer be seen so here's the writer for that. I not I apologize, it's slightly blurry, but I've highlighted the key points. Now, this is from a real life exam paper. And as you can see, as the temperature increases, it takes less and less time for the solution to become obscured. And you'll get a graph like that. So here is a six mark question, plan and investigation. Put it in a conical flask, place it on a cross, give it a bit of a swirl, start the stopwatch, and repeat and find, I mean, all your standard stuff for six marks. Controlling variables, that was very important. You must control the concentration, volume, uh, all the time. But one thing they don't mention is the human elements. You must have the same person with the same eyesight looking at the cross from the same angle. I have terrible eyesight, so I'd see the cross disappear a lot quicker than someone else. And if you're looking at a different angle, you'll have a parallax error like you would with a measuring cylinder. This is rarely mentioned, but just to be aware of it in case it comes up, okay? Now we're on to topic 6B, chemical equilibrium. We're nearly there. We're doing great, okay? So what is chemical equilibrium, okay? It is when there is a backwards reaction as well as a forwards reaction. 
This is weird. So far, we've only encountered one-way chemical reactions. Reactants make products, and that is it. But that's not it. Okay, the reality is more complex. It is also possible for the products to break down to the reactants. We call this the backwards reaction. And as you can see, A and B has broken back to A plus B. In general, that's a bad thing. We want to make products. We already have a reactant. Why would we want more of them? We want to make our products. So this is what chemical equilibrium is all about, is making the forward reaction go and reducing the backwards reaction. That is what it's all about. Okay, so... The best way to highlight this is a case study about the, what we call the Haber process making ammonia. Now, I know in combined science, this isn't officially on it, but it is the best way to explain the topic. So I'm going to explain it using the Haber process. The Haber process is used to manufacture ammonia, which we use 150 million tons of it in 2022. It's one of the world's most produced products, 80% of which goes into making fertilizers, which are essential for food production. If you really want to know, NH3 is ammonia, and NH2 is the amino group of amino acids to make proteins. So you really need ammonia to make proteins for plants. That's the main thing, okay? Now, this Fritz Tabor dude, who it's named after, he wasn't actually a good dude. He, he invented chemical warfare in World War I, and he also invented the gas chambers, the gas that was used in the gas chambers in the Holocaust. So this is just a lesson that not all scientists, science can be a force for good, but it can also be a force for evil. And if you, I'm sure you might be familiar with that book on the right, what happens? Hmm. Okay, making ammonia, the Haber process. You take nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and you make ammonia, NH3. So the forward reaction is what we want, okay? One nitrogen reacts with three hydrogen uh, molecules and it is an exothermic reaction. But the reverse reaction can also happen. The ammonia can also decompose back into the nitrogen and I wanted to pay particular attention to the numbers. They are equal and opposite. If the forward reaction is exothermic, the backwards reaction will be endothermic. That's one mark. But you must say it will be equally endothermic. Plus 91 versus minus 91.8. When we combine the two equations, we replace the one-way arrow with the reversible reaction arrow. But you do give the energy change of the forward reaction. You do need to know the definition of chemical equilibrium when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the backwards reaction. One mark in a closed system for the second mark. That's a system where nothing can enter or leave. And a lot of students forget to write that. Hence why I've changed the font. So it's sometimes called dynamic equilibrium. You might want to spend a moment reading this. It might appear that's nothing changing, but when you zoom in, it is actually always happening. Ammonia is constantly forming, but it's decomposing back at the same rate, so there is no overall change. Now, Le Chatelet's principle, okay? A dynamic equilibrium. If you change the conditions, the position of equilibrium moves to counteract that change. This might sound confusing. But in plain English, it means this. An H chemical reaction comes to a natural equilibrium where it is, in inverters commas, happiest. If I change any of these conditions, then the system will adjust to reduce the effect of this change. If I increase the temperature, the system will adjust to decrease the temperature. An endothermic reaction will be favored. If I increase the pressure, the system will adjust to decrease the pressure it will move to the side with fewer moles of gas. If I increase the concentration, the system will adjust to decrease the concentration. That means if I, my product increases, I need to keep getting rid of my product or it will just decompose back into the reactants. So what's the point of all this? Chemistry is all about making desired products. Therefore, if we they break down into the reactants. It's a waste of time and money. And we just want to make lots of product. And we want to favor the forward reaction. Don't actually say lots of money. But let's be honest. That's the real goal. 
So making ammonia, the Haber process, here is what we're going to do. How do we maximize the yield of our ammonia? How do we shift the equilibrium as far to the right as possible? You need to know the reaction conditions. So I know this diagram looks complicated, but just follow me from left to right. In green at the top, I have nitrogen. I get that from the air. In well, I'd say pink, and I have hydrogen. I generally get it from natural gas, although you can get it from the electrolysis of seawater, but it's not as energy efficient. You put them into a reaction chamber at 450 degrees Celsius, a pressure of 200 atmospheres at the very high pressure, and an iron catalyst is also used. You then cool the gases down, and the ammonia turns to a, a liquid, and you've got your product. That's the overall reaction mechanism. Now I'm going to talk through it at each one of these conditions in a bit more detail. One, the high pressure, 200 atmospheres. Well, if you look, there are, sorry, it's just a bit blocked there. There are four moles of gas on the left, but two moles of gas on the right. The diagram at the bottom shows it more clearly, okay? So there is twice the pressure on the left, and only half the pressure on the right. So if I increase the pressure, the system will adjust to decrease the pressure by favoring the forwards reaction. And the forwards reaction will make more of our product. So you want a high pressure, 200 atmospheres is a high pressure. This is exactly what I've just said. Uh, but a question that has been asked, why not increase the pressure pressure even higher high pressures are expensive to maintain need strong tanks and can be dangerous and explosive next the temperature of 450 degrees now the forge reaction is exothermic so you may think you'd want to make it as cold as possible so it would favor the forge exothermic reaction but in reality you use a temperature of 450 degrees celsius not too hot so as you can see from the equation the energy of the reactant is lower than the energy of the products so you would think that you would need a low temperature but in reality we say we use a compromised temperature this is because the rate of reaction would just be too slow otherwise and i wouldn't be making ammonia at a reasonable rate so it's called a compromised temperature hot enough to ensure a reasonable rate of reaction but not too hot to shift the equilibrium too far to the left, decreasing the yield. A compromised temperature is the key word. It's a bit like a Goldilocks in the porridge. Hot, but not too hot, okay? Just the right temperature. You don't want it too cold or too hot. 450 degrees is just the right temperature for this reaction. Next on to concentration. If I let the ammonia build up, the system will adjust to decrease the concentration of the ammonia. In other words, it will favor the backwards reaction and the ammonia will decompose back into our products, decreasing our yield. So if I must constantly remove the ammonia to prevent this from happening, how do I do that? It's done by distillation. I've given you the boiling points of nitrogen, minus 195, hydrogen, minus 252, Ammonia, because it is a much larger molecule with stronger weak intermolecular forces, has a higher boiling point of minus 33. So therefore, if say I have it cool it to minus 40, the ammonia will be liquefied and thus flow out in a container, whereas the nitrogen and hydrogen will remain as gases and they are just pumped back in and recycled. If they don't react the first time, they might react the second time, or the tenth time, or the fifteenth time. That's why I'm not too worried about yield in this reaction, because anything that's not used is just recycled, so it will all react eventually. You're going to spend a moment reading this. It's just exactly what I said. And then a catalyst do. Why do I add a catalyst? It lowers the activation energy by providing an alternative reaction pathway. And that is how we cover the Haber process and explain chemical equilibrium. Now, here's some exam questions on this. 
Name one source of the hydrogen, natural gas. Now, here I've underlined in green, suggest, because suggest questions where students spend too much time. Air must not get it in. Now, it took me a moment when I saw this question to think, air, mm, we want the nitrogen, what's wrong with oxygen? Oh, there's hydrogen in there, it will make water. But that took me, a science teacher of 15 years, a bit of thinking. You and the pressure of an exam, it mightn't come to you. Look, it's worth two marks. Don't waste too much time on it. Either you get it straight away or just move on. That's exam technique. Although question three is easy. Describe what happens to the mixture of gases. The ammonia condensation is liquefied and the nitrogen and hydrogen are recycled. Easy three marks there. Here is what we use, a pressure of 250 atmospheres. And they give you the 400 degrees Celsius mark. In reality, we use 450 degrees Celsius, but they give you 400 here. Use figure two to suggest and explain what the conditions used are a temperature of 450 degrees and a pressure of 200 atmospheres. This is a five mark question, okay? And it says use figure two, but it doesn't really use much data from it, but here is your answer. The reaction is reversible, so the forward reaction is exothermic, so increasing the temperature lowers the yield, but a lower temperature would decrease the rate of reaction. Here's where the compromised temperature comes in. So you get three marks for talk about compromised temperature, and then the pressure is easy. A higher pressure would increase the yield of ammonia, because there are fewer moles of gas on the product side. But too high a pressure would involve a high cost. They say ignore the risk of explosion though, and some years they give marks for that, so I have put a question mark beside that. Here are three questions. A, gas X, name gas X, clearly going to be hydrogen. I think we know our temperature by now is 450 degrees and our pressure is 200 atmospheres. And suggest why ammonia condenses, but the other gases do not. Well, ammonia has a higher boiling point. Easy, easy, easy. Now we're on to non-Haber process chemical equilibrium questions, and then we're done, okay? And they very often involve color, so you can see what's going on. So, for example, the reactant side is yellow, and the product side is colorless. You don't have to know what thiocyanide is. You don't have to know anything about it. Just know the colors. The one thing I don't like is it was expected that you know that red and yellow make orange. Most people in the world know this, but it's not an art exam. It's a science exam, and they should specifically tell you that, but they do not. They expect you to know that, okay? So let's take a look at some of the questions they would ask you regarding this, okay? So... A few drops of the thiocyanide, the colorless ones, a few, basically, they're increasing the concentration of the reactant. What happens to the color change? Well, the system will adjust to decrease the concentration of reactant by making more product, so it will become redder. Explain the color change observed. It will become more red because it shifts the position of the equilibrium to, to the right so that the concentration of the thiocyanide ionizes is, is reduced. I hope you can follow that. Here's another example, temperature. A water bath is set up at a temperature above room temperature. Explain what this shows. When a test tube containing the orange equilibrium is placed in a water bath, it becomes more yellow. Well, I know it favors the endothermic reaction so the, if the backwards reaction is endothermic, the forwards reaction must be exothermic. So read the example there. The position of equilibrium moves to the left so that the temperature is reduced. So therefore, the forward reaction is the opposite. It must be exothermic. Here's another example. The production of methanol. A pressure of 100 atmospheres is used. Why? equilibrium so you get two marks for talking about chemical equilibrium that there are fewer moles of gas on the product side there's only one mole compared to three and then you get the other two marks by saying increasing the pressure will mean there are more collisions per unit time
because there are more particles per unit volume. So it's kind of combining the rate part with the equilibrium part for four marks. Here's another example here. I've done the maths for you. Two plus four plus one is there's seven moles of gas on the left. Four moles of gas are right. State and explain the effect of increasing pressure on the yield and the rate. And it's the same thing again. The yield increases because of the, the system adjusts to reduce the pressure because there are fewer moles of gas on the product side. And it increases the rate of reaction because there are more collisions per unit time. Same answer again. Now, our final question, our final question, and then we're done. And they talk about cobalt. You don't need to know anything about cobalt. You just need to know about the colors. Pink well, on the reactant side, blue on the product side. And the forward reaction is endothermic. So when both, you need, they do expect you to know that pink and blue make purple. Again, don't really agree with it, but I don't make the exam paper. So explain what is meant by equilibrium. The forwards and backwards reaction occur at exactly the same rate in a closed system for the third mark. Remember, I always said that. Now, the forward reaction is endothermic. The equilibrium mixture is cooled, so it's going to favor the backwards exothermic reaction to heat it back up. That's what chemical equilibrium. So what will happen to the concentration of the pink compound will, will increase because the backward or reverse reaction is favored because it is exothermic. Easy. More hydrochloric acid. That's a reactant. Well, I need to get rid of the reactants. So it will favor the color. It will turn bluer because it will favor the forward reaction because the equilibrium will move to the right to decrease the concentration of hydrochloric acid. And that's it. That's chemical equilibrium and the rate of reaction all done. I will see you in our next video for organic chemistry. Okay, so well done and you can do it. I'll, I'll be back soon. All the best.